Well, welcome everybody. This is our uh, first Financial Management Association, or FMA, uh, meeting for the fall, fall semester. Uh, my name is Jeff Coy. I'm a, a professor <coughs> of finance here. Um, I teach uh, corporate finance, uh, intermediate corporate finance, and um, international finance. Uh, the other faculty advisor to the club is Phil Stuchinski here. He teaches, I think, currently, what, 420? Yes. And uh, in the spring, 301? Yeah, so uh, counting 305. OK. And uh, Nicole Kittleberger is uh, your club president. So um, what we're going to do in this first meeting is uh, we have a guest speaker, uh, Jennifer Vespina. She Hi. also uh, teaches Finance 301 here. Uh, and works for your insurance. I'll let Nicole um, introduce her shortly. But uh, before we get started uh, on that, I want to go through some of the uh, administrative stuff and show you where information is and where you can find information on uh, FMA Club and some of the things that we've got going on uh, in the finance program. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I know that most of you probably have this page up on your canvas. The um, uh, this is the Barrett Finance page, so everybody that's declared a finance major uh, should have access to this. Uh, does anybody not have access to this page? Okay, that's good. So um, that means you've declared. That's what that means. Um, or, or you asked one of us to put you in there. So there's a lot of information in here. This isn't specific to the FMA Club, but the FMA Club is part of what is in here. So the first thing that I want to show you is this engaging with the Penn State Barron Finance Program. So there's there's quite a bit of information in here. Uh, these finance speaker series, those are different from the speakers that we have at our club meetings. Uh, these are usually folks that come in and they talk a little longer uh, and they uh, have a, a topic of interest that's usually not just to students, but to a little wider audience. And we invite people from off campus uh, to these as well. But this is tied in with the FMA club. These are the types of speakers that we would bring in, and we organize those most of the time as well. Um, this is our club, the Financial Management Association. So there's a bunch of information in here. At the bottom of the box is my email, Nicole's email, and uh, Phil's email. Uh, so if you need to contact any of us about any questions, I'd start with Nicole. She probably has more answers than, than the two of us do. Um, so. Uh, um, if you have some questions for us, the information is there. So um, FMA is not just specific to Barron. Uh, FMA is an international organization. Um, all, most finance programs around the country and around the world have an FMA club. Um, the FMA... FMA website. This is the join or renew. FMA is a great thing to put on your resume. Um, there's a lot of things that FMA offers that you can take advantage of, both, both as a student and as a professional when you get out there. Uh, as far as students go, there's job boards in here. You can post resumes and things in here uh, so that employers can see them. So, And there's a lot of information that can help you in the job process and the job search. Uh, be careful, there's two different kind of categories of job searches in the FMA. One is academic, that's like what we do, that's hiring people to, to work at universities, uh, unless that's something you're interested in and you go to school, grad school or something. That's not the kind of jobs that you're looking for, but they also have professional jobs in here. So there's two, two different types of job postings in FMA. So, so if, you, if you open up what you think is jobs and they're all teaching positions, you know you're in the wrong one. So. <clears throat> So in order, to, um, in order to post FMA on your resume, and they like employers, um, maybe you might not know this, and this would be a good piece of information to know for the future, uh, don't put anything on your resume unless, you, unless you're willing to let that employer uh, investigate and check to see if it is true. Um, uh, I, I, knew, I have a friend that was uh, a recruiter for about 30 years. And she, she throws me little bits of information like this all the time. She's like, you know, don't, don't tell, them put, tell them, don't put something like Excel on your resume if you're not willing to sit down in front of a computer in an interview and, and show them what you know how to do. So uh, uh, other things are like this. So a big benefit to being part of these clubs are it, it gives you talking points in resumes. It's something outside of the classroom. 
Uh, everybody in here that gets a finance degree is going to learn things like the capital asset pricing model. Nobody in an interview ever for a job is going to ask you how to calculate the expected return on a stock with the capital asset pricing model. What they do want to talk to you about in interviews are uh, things outside of the classroom that you've done, the talking points. They want to see what kind of fit you're going to be with your company. So there's really three primary things uh, that can help you out in that area, put, you, put those bullets on your resume. Uh, and these are pretty much in order. The first one's internships. Uh, there's no question that that will uh, set you apart and uh, possibly get you jobs long before you graduate, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, proof right here. Nicole got a job from an internship this summer that she's going to be really happy with. So um, uh, internships. Um, second one is getting involved with stuff like this. Uh, getting involved with um, clubs like this. Uh, uh, talking points, things that we're going to do. We're going to have lots of speakers over the course of the year. We're going to uh, take the group off campus and visit some places. Our first one this fall is on October 30th um, to Erie Insurance and we're going to spend a good part of the day with them and talking to their uh, HR department and finding out what job opportunities and internship opportunities they have and they're going to show us around a little bit. So uh, these are these are great things to talk about when you're in interviews. And the third thing on my list is, um, is volunteering. Uh, employers love to talk about volunteering and the volunteering work that you've done. And we've got opportunities for volunteering too, not just an FMA club. Uh, I and Dr. Philbeck, who's the director of the School of Business, we are on the education board for junior achievement in the area, and um, there's lots of opportunities to volunteer with them. So if you're interested in, in those volunteer opportunities, uh, I know most about that one, but I can point you in the direction of other volunteer opportunities as well, uh, please contact me, and I'll be more than happy to get you involved. Uh, the junior achievement, if you haven't heard about it, is uh, it's a lot of fun. It's going into elementary schools and junior highs and, and teaching some basic business concepts to some students. Um, and you know, we've, some of us here have volunteered the junior achievement before. So uh, um, those are the types of things. So this is one of those things on that list that you want to start getting involved in. And um, you're already here, so you already probably know that for the most part. So in order to put this, uh, credibly put this on your resume, um, you have to, there's two dues. One is our, our, our local dues here, our Baron dues, and those are only $15. Uh, and then there's the uh, dues to the student dues to the organization, that's $35. So in total, it's only $50. I know $50 can be a lot of money uh, at some times, but for, the, for what you get by being able to go in here and, and interact with, uh, with professionals, and get your resume posted and look at jobs and things like that, it's pretty worth it. So <clears throat> uh, this is the page that where you'll go. Uh, you have to join the, uh, uh, or you'll have to create a, a username and that stuff and that, that's all, all free. So let me put my information in here to open up the page. If I put the right information in here. All right. So, uh, so you'll have different membership things in here. The professional membership, that's, that's not for students. That's uh, after you get out and you get a job, you want to continue being part of FMA. That's the professional membership. Uh, sustaining professional membership, that's 125. Um, these are um, graduate students, and here's you right here, this 35. Uh, National Honor Society, you'll pay 40. Uh, if you qualify for the National Honor Society, uh, you will get an email from me this semester telling you that you did and uh, inviting you to, uh, to join the National Honor Society. Uh, in fact, that's on my to-do list. I have to get that done here pretty soon. So um, if you qualify for that, I'll be in contact probably in the next couple of weeks or so, um, and then it's $40. But what's cool about that, and for an extra charge above the $40, is if you're in the Honor Society, you can uh, pay a little extra and have, um, what do they call it? Cord. Uh, it's a cord. It's an extra cord you can wear around uh, on your robe for graduation. So uh, it distinguishes you in that way. Maybe it's not cord. I think it's like a, it's like white. It's like thick. I think it's blue and white. I think it's. Yeah. Uh, that's that's a, pretty good. There's a logo. <laughs> blue and white. So what you'll do here is you'll you'll hit the down arrow and you'll say student. 
or if you qualify for the Honor Society, you'll click on the Honor Society student, but it's a student anyway. So you have the one year membership there. It's already got my name and information in here because I logged in. And then you'll go down here, and if you choose to, you can pick uh, an area that you're in. And you got general finance, institutions, insurance, investments, corporate finance. Uh, student type, you click on undergraduate, obviously. Uh, you want to be listed in the directory? Absolutely, you do. That's one of the benefits of being involved here. Um, and then there'll be a drop down menu, and it's got all the schools that have a chapter. So you'll go down to Pennsylvania State University, Barron and which is right here and um, click on that and then down here for local chapter dues we're $15 so you just click on that $15 and answer these questions down here and you can get um, signed up so that's the FMA page and how to get signed up and there's a lot more information here in this FMA page there are conferences and things you can go to if you happen to be somewhere where there's a conference. It's usually kind of interesting to go see what's going on at some of them. Some of the conferences are presenting papers uh, that folks like me are trying to get published. Um, but there's other things going on at those conferences that, that you might be interested in doing. <clears throat> so that information's here. It, it shows you the dues, $35, the international, and the Baron dues are 15 right here. Um, I think of what else we have here. So uh, there's another club, the Financial Planning Club. So financial planning is something you're into. Uh, there's information on that club, the Business <laughs> Analytics Team, Student Managed Investment Fund. There's a lot of things going on uh, in this page. So a couple things that we wanted to show you is uh, this is one that you may be interested in. Um, I think a bunch of you are already aware and already involved, but uh, we have scholarships for um, the CFA examination. Uh, we have to 17, is that what we're on now? 16 or 17? Uh, scholarships to take level one of the CFA. That's the gold standard designation in the professional field uh, for finance. Uh, it's not necessary for any job, so we don't want to scare you off in that way. But uh, it's, it's extremely helpful. And coming out of school and taking the exam as you're starting a job or before you start a job is another one of those things on your resume that will really set you uh, uh, apart from other folks. And because we have three CFAs on our faculty here, I'm not one of them, uh, um, we have 16, it's either 16 or 17 scholarships for level one. And that includes not just taking the test, but all the study material for it and all that stuff. Uh, so in addition to that, we have, there's plenty of other professional designations out there that you can get in finance and other fields. And we have scholarship money. Um, I don't think they call it scholarship, but it's, it's, it's monies that are set aside for students that are pursuing these degrees. And outside of the FMA scholarships that I just spoke about, you can get money from the school to help defray the costs of the materials that you need for some of these other professional designations. And this is not specific to finance. If there's any professional designations, even outside of finance, that this is this is a school of business funds. This is not uh, finance specifically. So that application is up here as well. It's attached here, and that deadline is Monday, October 28th. So you want to get that in if that's something that you would like to check out. Um, so down here, there's this is your student managed fund information and there's business analytics team information. Our meetings are gonna be posted here under uh, the FMA. So this is tonight's meeting. There's some information here on our speaker and uh, those will be posted there as we get that information for our other meetings. Uh, our other meetings are pretty also much- Also on Baron Singh too. Also on Baron Singh, thank you. Um, we have our speakers set up for the rest of the semester. We're just waiting to get the, uh, the information from them, their personal information, so we can post it here and, uh, and then order our room and, and get set up. So that's where the, the meetings will be, uh, will be set up. So uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, turn it over to Nicole. She's gonna talk about this uh, opportunity for these mentoring programs that we have here, and she's going to introduce our speaker. Um, yeah, so they sent us an email asking us to um, tell you guys about this me new mentoring program they're doing, and I guess there's um, ones for like domestic students with international students, which 
it is a good opportunity for not only international students wanting to kind of get more, um, I guess, acclimated to the culture, but then if you want to put, like we were talking about your resume, that's good to show that you are getting involved outside of just the, um, outside of school. Also, there's mentorships with uh, freshman and sophomore to junior and senior. Uh, that's awesome. I know a lot of the classes that I ended up taking was because seniors or juniors when I was freshman and sophomore um, recommended them to me. So I think it's a really good opportunity for underclassmen to um, get a, you know, get advice from students who had just gone through it. And then once again, for juniors and seniors, that's great for you to put on your resume to show um, when you're going into an interview that you do have leadership experience and you can work with people like you did in uh, being a mentor like this. So just something to think about. I'm sure they'll be sending out some emails to you guys to get involved with that. Um, so then without further ado, I guess I will introduce our speaker, Jen Besvina. She's been working in finance, uh, well, corporate finance for over eight years. So she definitely has a lot of experience that she can speak to. Um, right now she's senior finance um, business partner, your insurance, that's fairly new, but before that she was with uh, TechNIP, which is really interesting, so I'm sure she'll pull on that and kind of give you guys an idea of the different routes you can take in um, the finance world outside of just the classroom, and uh, she'll really be giving us some good things to know that you can't really get just sitting in the class, so definitely listen, pay attention, and Jenna Mosfina, let's give her a warm welcome. <laughs> Uh, first, I'll just start off by talking a little bit about my education and my background, and hopefully I can give you some really good advice going forward, both if you're looking for internships, and also if you're trying to, if you are considering corporate finance as your career path. So I'll try not to bore you with too many details, but if you are interested in corporate finance and you have questions, just stop me and ask, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. Um, so just looking back, I actually started out as an accounting major. Um, I have a lot of accountants in my family, so it was just like a natural step for me to go into accounting, uh, except that I hated accounting. And um, I can remember when I took my first finance class, it was actually corporate finance, and I thought this is much more my speed, finance, than accounting, so I switched. Um, and I can remember as a finance major and all the way through my undergrad, not really knowing what area of finance I wanted to go into. Um, I was leaning towards investments. Um, I was considering sitting for the CFA exam. Um, I knew I was more of an analytical person than I was, you know, like a CFP, like a financial planner. Um, so I really thought I was going to go and take my CFA exam um, and go into investments, maybe portfolio management. Um, I ended up working right uh, out of college. I ended up working for HBK Sourcy at the time in their financial planning unit. Uh, but I knew I didn't want to be in financial planning. So at the time, I was studying for CFA level one. Um, but I was working for HPK Sourcy in 2008. And late in 2008, we had this huge financial crisis. And they laid off my entire department. So I didn't have my CFA. And I didn't have a job. And I switched gears. And I got my MBA instead. So I got my MBA here at Barron. And I did it in one year. So I just full time MBA knocked it out, got it out in one year. And before I had even finished my MBA um, program, I interviewed with a, local, with a company, it's a Fortune 500 um, oil and gas company called Technip FMC. They have a division here in Erie and I interviewed with them and they hired me like almost immediately. Um, the interesting thing about going into something like corporate finance is that MBAs are very highly valued. Um, the job that I started was actually more of an entry level position, but they were not gonna give that job to anybody who didn't have an MBA. So if, you, if corporate finance is a route you're thinking about taking, an MBA is one thing I would definitely consider, at least consider going that route. Um, so I started out as a financial analyst. Like I said, it was pretty much an entry level position and I did what any entry level person would do, which is gather a lot of data and put it together for somebody else to present to management or for somebody else to come up to, with conclusions and uh, generate ideas for the business. Um, and I worked in that role for a couple of years and then I was promoted to FP&A manager. And FP&A is a route you can take in corporate finance, it's financial planning and analysis. Um, and what an FP&A role will typically do in corporate finance is take all of this data and take all of these numbers and put them together in such a way that you can help the business make good decisions. 
You can help the sales department on projects that they're working on. You can help operations. Should they invest in a $4 million machine? Is that a good idea? Um, so you can work with all the different departments and you also are gonna take this information and present it to the executive leadership team. Uh, so FP&A is a really crucial role um, in corporate finance. Uh, the funny thing about corporate finance is that it's extremely accounting centric, which I didn't know when I accepted my first job. Uh, and how much I did not like accounting that I was going to be doing it for the rest of my life, basically. Um, so with that said, uh, what I would, I guess if I could give you any advice when it comes to corporate finance, it would be not, not only to think about doing your MBA, but also think about doing your CPA, uh, not only because it looks good on your resume, but because when you actually get into the nuts and bolts of doing your job, it's just gonna give you so much more insight and you're gonna understand how the business works and you're gonna understand what these numbers mean and how it impacts the business. So I know the CPA is not usually a designation we talk about a whole lot in finance. We're more CFA and CFP oriented. Um, but one thing I have noticed, especially over the last couple of years, is I think you guys are already aware pretty much that bachelor's degrees are pretty widespread. And if you're trying to set yourself apart, and you're sending your resume out there into the corporate world or, or whatever, into the job environment, everybody has a bachelor's degree, it seems like. So it doesn't, it's really hard to set yourself apart from somebody else. And just from a management perspective, and as I have looked at resumes that have come across my desk and I've chosen who to interview and who not to interview, what's gonna set you apart as an undergrad if you're looking for an internship is joining these programs. So if you can, you know, participate in the student managed fund, if you can be an active member of the FMA. Um, these are the things that, uh, the investment research challenge, I think that's another really good one. Um, even though those things didn't really apply, I'm looking for a corporate finance intern, right? The investment research challenge is not gonna be that big of a deal for what you're gonna do on a regular basis as a finance intern in a corporate finance position. Um, same with the investment, um, the investment fund. You know, that kind of knowledge isn't gonna take you very far in a corporate finance internship. But those things will set you apart from everybody else who has a 3.5 or a 3.7 GPA, and it's gonna set you apart from everybody else who's on the same track as you and who's trying to get that same internship. So I would definitely get involved here because compared, I've seen a lot of Barron resumes, I've seen a lot of Gandon resumes, and Mercyhurst re resumes, and the Barron resumes by far are light years ahead of Gannon and Mercy Hurst. Just because of the programs that are offered here, you have to actually participate in the programs, but I would say get involved because it does set you apart from everybody else. Um, what else? Oh, the other trend that I have noticed, um, so eventually you'll have internships and then you'll be looking for full-time jobs. And maybe you'll come out and you'll have your bachelor's degree. Maybe by then you'll have considered getting your MBA. Um, more and more in corporate finance, MBAs, I hate to say this because I'm a huge proponent of the MBA program and I definitely highly, highly recommend it, is that MBAs are becoming a dime a dozen as well. It's kind of like the route of bachelor's degrees. Like everybody has one, it kind of seems like. And so what I've noticed more and more, and this is very recently, I would say within the last couple of years, I've noticed that what is going to set you apart, what's going to set you apart from people who have their bachelor's degree, who've gotten a good internship, who maybe are pursuing their MBA or have already gotten it, it's certifications. And I really think that certifications are like the way of the future. Um, it, is, it is going to help you in your career search. It's going to set you apart. Um, and it's gonna give you that little bit of extra knowledge. I have a question. How yeah. important would you say it is to get an MBA from like a more well-known school than one that's like, you know, if I were to get an MBA from like NYU Stern rather than like Penn State Fair? Well, you know, they say the further you are away from your degree, the more it's worth, but I do not find that to be the case. Um, I've found that while I've been interviewing, and even recently I've switched jobs, so I worked at Technip FMC for eight years, and then only three weeks ago I started working at Erie Insurance. And while I was... <laughs> Sorry about that. It's very new, very new, very busy. It's okay. Um, while I was interviewing at Erie Insurance, I thought, you must interview all kinds of people who have MBAs from Penn State. So I didn't really play it up while I was interviewing. I was like, okay, yeah, it's there. It's a bullet point on my resume. But they told me in the interview, you have an MBA from Penn State, and that's something that we highly respect. And that's going to help you get your foot in the door here. So it's, it's still very valuable to have it from here. Yeah. What about like grant funders? Do I know anything about like branching off and going to a different school to get your MBA? Because I heard that was good because you like 
different. It's true, and I did my undergrad here, and I did my MBA here, and I was nervous doing my MBA here for That's that reason. Yeah. I was nervous because, um, you know, I heard it's best to you know go somewhere else, and if you do it at the same school, it doesn't seem as valuable. Um, I have not had that experience. I've had absolutely no negative feedback from that. In fact, I don't think anybody really looks at where I did my undergrad. They all look at where did I do my MBA. Oh. Yeah. Yes. Uh, two questions for you. So the first one you talked about was the corporate finance route and how we are kind of more investment dominant here at Penn State Baron. Yes. How would you say from somebody that wanted to go towards a corporate finance route that you would be involved here aside from like the FMA club? From your understanding. Aside from the FMA club, yeah. I would still and look like corporate finance isn't just FPNA. If you're going to go in FPNA, the CPA is extremely valuable. I would definitely try to get involved somehow um, and consider going the CPA route. <clears throat> but corporate finance is not just FPNA, which is what I do. But you can also end up in Treasury, and you're going to work with investments, and you're going to. Um, so if you are with the Investment Research Challenge or the Student Managed Fund, you're going to get a lot of good experience from that that's going to help you in other avenues in corporate finance because corporate finance does have an investments division. Um, even you know where I work now, um, they manage a huge surplus and they have to make sure that they're investing that wisely so that they can grow the surplus and that they have enough money to pay out claims in the future. So um, still, I would still take advantage of those opportunities because like me, you never know where your career is going to take you. I never in a million years thought I would be in corporate finance. One, one thing that goes up with what Dave was saying too is uh, if you're not aware of one of the benefits of going to school here as opposed to say Penn State's main campus where the school of business does not allow their students to double major, you can double major here. And the way that it's set up, um, if you know you have a certain amount of electives to take. So for example, finance and accounting, if you take all of the accounting requirements as your electives, I think you only have to take what, one, one more or two more classes above what you normally would for a finance degree to have a dual degree in accounting and finance, and that would go a long way to what she's talking about. If I could go back in time, I would absolutely double major. If I know now what I, if I knew then what I know now, I would definitely double major in finance and accounting. Uh, but because I didn't like accounting, I avoided it like the plague. But starting out at my d new job, I feel like it set me back, and it took me a lot longer to figure out what I was doing because I didn't have that foundational knowledge. Yeah. So jumping off of what he said, my second question was, so do you think somebody that has a dual major in accounting and finance, it'd be better for them to have the MBA versus the CPA because they already have accounting knowledge or That's from, from an, like an interview standpoint? I've had many people, I've talked about this with some of my past um, bosses, some of the people that I report to. When I first started on at Technique FMC, um, I had said to my boss, maybe I should consider getting my CPA. And he said, no way, you have your MBA, same thing. It's not the same thing. And then years later, now when I worked for Technip FMC, I had like seven bosses in eight years. But years later, I had another boss who said, if you're gonna be in corporate finance, we much would rather see you have a CPA than an MBA. So it's kind of a judgment call, like which way you wanna go. At this point in my career, I do not have a CPA, but I would say like looking forward, if I'm gonna stay in corporate finance, if I'm gonna go the director route, or if I wanna be a controller of a division somewhere, um, I would still even now consider getting my CPA. I just didn't know if you felt that, I know MBAs kind of move you out of the, uh, like more of a role versus into management. I know they kind of look for that or some places require it. I know Federated Investors won't will only move you so high if you don't have MBA. So I didn't know if that was maybe a trade off versus having the CPA. I think it just depends. Everybody's gonna have a different opinion of which one is more valuable. And I think management is gonna value the MBA, but the hardcore like controllers and accounting people in corporate finance are gonna value the CPA. And so, um, if I, I don't know, if I went back, I would get my MBA. I would, if I had to choose between the two, I would definitely do MBA. Thank you. Yeah. You can do it all, just do it all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wish I could tell you more about my current job, but I've only been in this role for three weeks and I know very little about it at this point. But uh, the idea behind my current role is different than what I did before because in this role, I'm specifically gonna be a finance business partner in every sense of the word where I wasn't really before. Um, so in this case, I'll be working directly with the senior vice presidents of each division to help them build a budget, to help them uh, choose which projects to take to um, help them decide which projects are more valuable than others um, and help them make good decisions. So I am actually partnering with them 
because maybe the marketing SVP or senior vice president doesn't really have the, the financial acumen um, to just make these decisions by themselves. Um, so a lot of us are going to be graduating this year, and then obviously the rest who are not seniors will be coming up shortly after that. So could you kind of speak on, like, you, you've you gone into this new role, and you obviously have to adapt to a new space, which is something we'll have to do soon. Yes. Can you speak on, like, what you've been doing to I forgot how painful it is to start somewhere from you know from nothing and it, it's just a learning process right now I'm trying to embrace that I'm new I don't know anything like vibe you know <laughs> I'm just embracing that right now um, it is a huge transition and if you start out in an entry-level position I think expectations are going to be fairly low I don't think pressure is going to be really high and this is the other thing I kind of wanted to um, mention to you guys is that when you do come in in an entry level role, um, we already know if you can get your foot in the door, if you can get an interview by having this stellar resume, not only having the high GPA and not only being involved in these programs, if you can just get the interview, um, I'd love to spend this whole time just talking about how technically you should get all these things. Get your MBA, you know, do step one, step two, step three. But when I'm interviewing a candidate for a job, I already know, like, if this is an entry level position, this person on the other side of the table is going to know nothing. I'm going to teach them everything. I already know that going in. So the expectations are gonna be pretty low. You just, I think what's more important when you're at that phase, when you're in an interview, when you're first starting a job, is to have this sense of um, teamwork, uh, collaboration, really good communication, professionalism, be polite. The very first intern that I ever hired, I hired him strictly on the fact that he was the only one who sent me a thank you, a thank you email because they were all good candidates. I mean, everybody that I interviewed, I was like, oh, they're all good. This one's good. The next one's good. I didn't, I didn't interview anybody that I thought that guy is terrible. I'm not hiring him. They were all good, but this guy was so polite, you know. And, and during the interview, like he was very professional, very polite, and he followed up with me afterwards. Like these are the soft skills that you don't necessarily always learn in class. And I can say, get your MBA, get your CPA. It's not always the formula for success without these soft skills that you have to take with you no matter where you go, whether you're doing an internship, whether you're starting a new full-time position. It's just being willing to work with a team, just be willing to learn and, and be as helpful as you possibly can. Be professional, just don't ever be rude to anybody. You absolutely ruin your reputation with one rude email. Um, and I just can't stress that you know, when you're starting a new position, I think those soft skills are more important at that point than your resume. More important than what you've accomplished up to that point. It's how can you treat people and work with people going forward. So, and I think these are things that you learn a lot and you don't realize that you're learning it in your undergrad, but all these group projects that you work on, you think, well, this is great because I don't have to do all the work by myself, right? That's the advantage of it. But the other advantage is that you do learn how to work in that team setting and you do learn, like, I have to be nice to these people to get what I need from them, right? I can't be a jerk or they, you know, maybe I, they're not going to help me on my piece. So, you know, even World Campus, I think... So with my last job, I worked for an international company, and a lot of my finance team was not in Erie. Um, so I managed five um, business units. Only one of them was in Erie. I had one in Corpus Christi, Texas, I had one in Kansas, one in Germany, and one in Norway. And so uh, you have to be able to work with people, you know, through the internet, through you know, conferencing, and still come together and work as a team in order to accomplish a goal. So um, I think. I think these are, you know, some of the things to focus on. And I know it's a really long answer to your question, no, but awesome. yeah. Anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Do you think, like, in the long run, as far as like money goes, the MBA pays for itself after you get that and get into jobs? Definitely. And I, I mean, I'll just—I don't know if I should really do this, but I did my undergrad. I graduated in 2008, and my first position. Now, this is Erie, and I know like in Erie, you can sometimes have suppressed salaries here. It's just a, a fact of life that sometimes the salaries are suppressed here, partly because we don't have a lot of Fortune 500 companies here, and Fortune 500 companies are going to pay you more money. I mean, that's just the way it is. So my first job out of my four-year degree was around 40000 per year salary. I didn't work there for very long before I was laid off, and I got my MBA in one year, and before I had finished my MBA, I had a $70,000 job offer. I mean, 
And my MBA, I paid for it all myself, unfortunately. If you can get your employer to do it, do it, because it cost me $30,000 start to finish one year of schooling. It was a lot, but look at the difference in salary. I made that return on investment back in one year. Nice. Yeah. It's worth it, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you touch more on the uh, transition from a company like uh, Technif FMC to now to Erie Insurance? I know you have been working at Erie Insurance for yeah. too long, but... Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, so the transition is, it's a whole new world. It really is. Um, Technif FMC is an international company, so I'm used to working with teams in India and Germany, like all over the place on a regular basis. My boss was in Houston. Um, we merged with a French company a couple of years ago, so their headquarters are in Paris. Um, it's exciting. It's an exciting job. You can travel a lot. Um, but excitement is, in my world, often interchanged with stress. So I did a lot of travel. Um, and exciting for an oil and gas company right now isn't all that exciting if you follow the markets. Um, the oil and gas industry is not doing so hot. So it's been a rough couple of years. Yeah. So it's been a tough, uh, I guess since 2015, it's been a tough place to work. Um, a tough industry to work in, but it is exciting. Now, going to a company like Erie Insurance, um, it's very Erie-centric. All the executives are here in Erie. This is the headquarters. It's very different for me. Like, th there will be no travel in my future, which is good, but it is less exciting. So, I mean, just international company versus one that's not international. It's quite a transition. Yeah. Uh, so, about the MBA, I, I remember correctly, don't they typically I did it in three. I, I, I well, I just went full time. Three, uh, nine, nine semester hours a semester is considered full time as opposed to 12. Uh, yeah, so and I did 12. 12 a semester, you can do I did 12, and I did the brutal summer classes too, because I knew like if I get these summer classes out of the way, I'm going to finish this and graduate in the fall. And so I did it in one year. Yeah. But it was worth it. It was worth it. I didn't work. I wasn't working at the time, so it's a lot easier. If you're working and your employer is paying for it, it's going to take you longer to do it. Yeah. But you already have a job, so you might not in a big hurry that extra semester. That's right. You, you can take your, your time. time. You can take yeah. your time. I was in a hurry. Yeah. So I've heard from a lot of like people relative to my age that have gotten into the job field, the saying where it goes. It's not about the grades you make. It's about the hands you shake. How important do you think that is? Because getting your foot in the door is one thing with like a good looking resume, but if you're not personal or you don't know somebody. Um that's a tough question. And there's truth in there's truth in it a little bit. But I would say for the most part, I haven't known anybody to get my job at Technique FMC. I cut an advertisement out of the newspaper and literally mailed a hard copy of my resume in. They're very old fashioned, very outdated. Didn't know anybody there at the time. When I got that job, but they can tell from looking at your resume, like, is this person a go-getter? We need somebody who's going to hit the ground running. Does this person look like the right fit for our company? Like, your hard work goes a long way mm -hmm. in, in, in a corporation. And if and if it's the, only the hands you shake and you don't have the grades, the grades and the to ethic up. to back it up, they'll know very quickly that yeah. yes. Gotcha. So I I definitely place more emphasis on the grades and the hard work because. You can tell on a resume, but as soon as you hire somebody, you can tell very quickly if they've got what it takes. Yeah. Is that all? Um, so I feel like starting out in a job, like it's definitely a lot of pressure. And then like, I definitely think part of the pressure is like worried about making a mistake because you're new and you don't really know everything. Like you said, you kind of come in with everyone knows you don't know anything. So like, have you ever made like a big mistake in your career? Like, how did you come back from it? Or what was like the steps you took? Um, <laughs> no, sorry, <that> was a <laughs> big mistake. Um, so like I said, when I started at FMC, it was, it was a pretty entry level position. So there weren't a whole lot of opportunities for me to make mistakes. But I mean, there were times when it felt like a lot of pressure to not make any mistakes. Um, I can remember as that financial analyst, my boss was on vacation, the controller of the division was on vacation, and we had to do an inventory presentation to senior management. Um, so this was like executive level people. And they said, 
you can handle this while I'm gone. And it was bad news. Like, our inventory situation was out of control. And I had to explain, like, why and what we were going to do to get it back on track and what this meant for the business. And I can remember just sweating bullets. Like, I have to explain this bad news to this senior executive uh, manager. And, um, you know, I didn't mess it up, but you definitely feel the pressure of not wanting to mess up either. I guess the better way to ask it was how did you handle the pressure of not wanting to make mistakes? I overprepare, notoriously overprepare. Um, uh, you, as FP&A manager, I presented to uh, the executive leadership team all the time, and I would close my door and I would study for my presence. I'm not even kidding. Like four hours, I would study. I would know what was in every single account. I would know what the drivers were for every account. I would be fully prepared for every single question. I thought they would, this is overkill, but this is my personality, I can't help it. I would, I would way over prepare so that, sometimes when you over prepare for something, whether you know what you're doing or not, it gives you enough confidence, I think, to go in and speak intelligently about it so you don't make a fool of yourself. So that's the approach that I take, yeah. It, it pays off, it really does. <laughs> Or maybe on like um, like different interviews you've had, like when you're interviewing different people and what's gone well in interviews and what you didn't like what people have done. Yeah, so going back to like having a stellar resume, but you know, you need to have the soft skills. I when I was hiring when I was at PA manager, I was hiring a backfill as a financial analyst. So I was basically hiring somebody to fill my own position. And I interviewed quite a few people for that, and I was going to be really selective because I wanted somebody who was going to come in, hit the ground running, but also who was going to be able to work well with my team. And I had known my team for a really long time, and I wanted just the right person who could come in and um, be the great fit. So when you hear people say, like, you know, we want to make sure that you're a good fit for the company, what does that mean? It just means do you interview well. I really think that's what it means, do you interview well? Because I had this girl come in, and she had worked in finance for years at GE. And her resume was like Black Belt and Six Sigma and just complete rock star on paper. And when I brought her in to interview her, she sat with her arms crossed the whole time. And she was like kind of standoffish. And I just got this weird vibe from her that she wasn't like very nice. And like you have to be nice and you have to be easy to get along with. And you have, so when they say like, be a good fit. Like you want to be confident, you want to be yourself, and you want to know your stuff. But you also want to be professional, and you want to, you know, be open. Because I knew I was going to have to work very closely with this girl to get her up to speed, and she was going to work very closely with my team. And I really cared about my team a lot, right, in the direction that we were going. So I wanted somebody who was going to be, you know, friendly and outgoing, and somebody who was open to working in a group environment. And like, you know. Her resume was stellar, like I said, but I didn't hire her because I just thought her personality wasn't a good fit, and I think that's really just essentially what that means. Yeah. Could you touch on like what, so at the end of interviews, obviously you want to ask some questions to the employer, so like what are some, like what's some good questions that you've heard in the past? Just, I mean, we're all going to have interviews at some point. Well, even I just interviewed, right? Yeah. So I can remember the questions that I was asking, and it was like, what can you tell me about the day-to-day -day, you know, functions of this job? I mean, you don't want to step into a role you know nothing about. Um, so just ask about what does the job entail? Who am I going to be working with? Am I going to be working by myself mostly, or am I going to be working with a team? Like, um, I think those are some good questions. Um, what do you have in mind for this department going forward? What do you see as some of the challenges of this department going forward? I think those are really good questions. I, in an interview, I typically try to avoid questions like about any benefits. I wouldn't ask about how many days off am I going to get this year. I would avoid those, so I would not ask them. But if you ask questions about the job and they can see that you're interested and they can see that you're passionate about the job and you care about taking this job to the next level or trying to address some of the pitfalls, that's going to come across really well to a potential employer. You've had 30 days on uh, paid vacation every year to join the military. <laughs> Yeah, that was one of the nice things when I work with international companies, and I would go over to Germany every year to do budget, and they would tell me that they have six weeks of mandatory vacation every year. And I would say, can I just stay? Can I just stay here? And um, 
the interesting thing is if you're an expat, you can go over and you can work there, you can live there for a couple of years, but you keep your US benefits, you don't get theirs unless you're a citizen. <laughs> so I would be stuck with my you know, three, four weeks vacation. Uh, have you ever tried to negotiate your salary? Yes. Yes. Um, it works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't work. So um, early on, when I was at like a lower level, it was a lot easier to negotiate. There's a lot more wiggle room. You know, typically an employer tries to bring you in at like a midline or like 50% of what the market rate is, uh, in like within a range. And so you have a lot more wiggle room. But as you move up and you make more money, it, becomes a lot more difficult to negotiate. And I can remember in the MBA program, they offer a negotiations class, and I highly recommend, I think it's an elective, but you should all take it because it's, it really teaches you how to negotiate. And I'm like, I took negotiations. I'm going to negotiate with my boss. This was only a couple of years ago, and I'm going to get a whole bunch more money um, because I had a promotion. And she was like, this is your offer. And I was like, no. No, I, I want more money than this. So we went back and forth and we negotiated. And I thought I had a soundproof argument. And at the end of the day, she was like, you're right. And all, you have a very good argument. But the answer is no, this is the offer. That was it. And I took it. But sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. yeah. You should try. I mean, I even like tell my kids, like, the answer is always going to be no if you don't ask. So you should definitely ask. I mean, it's, it's perfectly normal. So I'm guessing it's probably something you should only do after you, uh, after they confirm that you've got the job done, or like once you're like in, like what point if would you? You would be in if you got an offer letter. Okay. So they would send you an official offer letter. They would email it or they would mail it to your house. Sometimes they do both, and then you can call HR and you can you know try to go back and forth and say, yeah. okay, this is a great offer. I'm really excited to work with your company, but you know how do you feel about this? You can definitely negotiate. And sometimes they will negotiate. So it's better to ask sometimes. Now, is it unwise to do so coming right out of school, though? Yes. Yes. So, <laughs> so when I got my first job offer coming out of my MBA, they told me on the phone, like, we are so excited to have you on. Instead of 50% of midline, we're going to bring you on a 65% of midline. Ah, there's no way I would ask for a penny more. Like, I was just happy that, you know, they thought highly of me. They were excited to have me on board. This was my first like real like high paying job, I was not gonna jeopardize it by asking for more money. Like I, I think if you're coming on as a first time, you know, you're not a career person yet, right? So you have to prove yourself, I think, in a, in a way. So give it a couple years and then if you feel you really make contributions to the team and then go in and ask for a raise. Yeah. But be able to defend one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Have your soundproof argument and good luck. <laughs> So for me in the process of looking at resumes and hiring people, how common and important is it do you see a reference to a LinkedIn account or something like that? A reference to what? LinkedIn. LinkedIn? LinkedIn? I've never paid any attention to it in my hiring process. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, honest, I don't use LinkedIn very much, but I don't want to speak for everybody else. Like, I think everybody has their own way of like looking people up and um, you know, some people will call people on the phone and do references instead, um, just to get that personal reference and talk to a human person, because you can make yourself look so good on paper, but um, I think it's really just like making that impression when you, when you get to talk to someone. Yeah. How much like stuff do you do this when you're coming in when you find somebody? How much stuff do you put in your social media? I've looked at everybody's social media before I hire like them. <laughs> I don't know, maybe because I'm nosy, but like I, I don't know. I, I mean, you can tell a lot by a person from their social media. Media, and I know, you know, people who have been fired for pictures on their social media. So like, lock down your account pretty tight if you don't want anybody to see it. I always look at. <laughs> I always do. I mean, I always do look at the social media just to kind of see. But I can tell from a picture. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Yeah. That's just me personally, though. I think maybe everybody does it by now. Yeah. 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 Best friend of a, of a divorce lawyer on um, <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> I mean, I know somebody who was um, teaching at one of the area high schools and posted a profile picture of a, a beer bottle and got fired. Like, 
So just be extra careful and make everything private if you're going to post something like that. Um, make burning accounts. <laughs> the king. <She's> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I do think in this day and age you have to be very careful what you post publicly. Yeah, just be careful about it. Yeah. Um, working on like the business partner side of FMA, um, do you think for you like your next jump upwards, um, you'll work on the consolidation side? Or is that do you see that as important? Consolidations? As in like financial consolidation? Yeah. In my last job, I, I did financial consolidations. I actually loved it. Um, I think that's why I worked with such a, a large group of people. Um, and you know, I could work directly with the controllers at each business unit to figure out what was going on in their business, so that I wasn't just crunching numbers. I was actually like, you know, putting together, consolidating good financial analysis for the for the company. And I, I do I did love consolidations. Yeah. I would I would do it again, but I'm not I'm not in that area. Anymore. There's probably time for one more, or you know, there's people are coming in at six. So if there's one more question, you can ask it. Or